Today we're going to continue our study on systematic theology, concluding lesson number 20, the doctrine of church character and policy. In the second part, we learned that the most important qualification of a pastor is his character. While a knowledge of the word is important, living that word is more important. We see that unity in the church is a reflection on our own original pastor, the Prince of Peace. And this harmony should be evident to the world. Jesus never gave a name to his church during his ministry, nor does it ever appear in the Bible. It was simply called the house of God. The church had over 100 members even before the day of Pentecost when many Protestants believed that the church was started. Jesus spent 40 days after his resurrection with his church, a time of testing and preparation for the thousands of years called the church age. And he taught them that whatsoever I have commanded you part of the Great Commission, the church's marching orders. We also see that to see how to run a mission program, we should look back to the church in Antioch in Syria. There are two churches in Antioch. And now the conclusion. Question 13. Did apostolic missionaries report to their sending church? In modern times, communication makes so many things easier. A missionary in Peru is but a phone call away from any of their supporting churches. Monthly or quarterly newsletters are sent out by many, if not most, foreign missionaries reporting of the progress of their work. All this is done without leaving the mission field. This is a great advantage from biblical times. During the first century, missionaries would be in the field for years without getting back to their sending church. Now, this doesn't mean the sending church was clueless as to what was happening because travelers would always bring news, and the occasional epistle would be sent with a trusted traveler. Missionaries would, when led by the Spirit, take the time and effort to return to their sending church, and in great detail let them know what God's work was doing. Let's take a quick look at Paul's travels. Now, his first missionary journey, if you look here, covered, looks like somewhere probably around 600 miles which doesn't sound a lot nowadays, but remember how transportation was done back then. The second journey covered literally thousands of miles. Very time consuming. Now the first GC, he returned to Antioch. The third journey got cut short at Jerusalem because of the arrest thing. And then we see here also his trip to Rome. Reporting back to the sending church serves the same purpose today as it did back then. Sharing good news as well as bad will lighten both the life as well as the load for everyone involved. It brings encouragement when the news is good and support when problems are learned of. Did apostolic missionaries report to their sending church? Acts chapter 14, beginning at verse 26, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Question 14. Is there any example of churches associating in mission work? There are basically three types of church organization type. You have your universal, your convention, and your association. We'll take a glance to see what the scriptures say concerning these, what is supported by scripture, and what is either ignored or refuted. But first, let's define what each is. The universal church belief says that every church is part of every other church, that we are all part of a single church. The Catholics believe that this church is based in the Vatican, while Protestants believe it's centered in heaven, so it seems. Conventionists believe that the larger churches, the more sway they have over smaller congregations, that these churches answer to a convention board, which can override individual church desires. Associationists believe that each church is independent from each other, but can and should work together to advance the cause of Christ. That such association is voluntary and doesn't affect the individuality of any of the churches involved. Is the concept of a universal church mentioned in Scripture? Some misinterpret Hebrews 12.23. This is a listing of those people you'll meet in heaven as a confirmation. Those who do this must read verse 22 to see what is being spoken of. If there is one universal church, why did Paul begin his letter to the Galatians with unto the ecclesias of Galatia, unto the churches of Galatia, when he began his first letter to Thessalonians with 
unto the ecclesi of the Thessalonians, unto the church of the Thessalonians, because there is more than one church. There is no universal church. What about conventions? Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. The word here translated as a rule is the word heiomai, and is better translated as lead. Just as Jesus is the chief shepherd, bishops and deacons are shepherds also. Lesser shepherds, but shepherds nonetheless. Shepherds do not rule over a flock but they do lead it. And if you don't remember how Jesus feels about anyone ruling over another in a church, remember what he said about the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2.6 and 2.15, and see if he is encouraging this in his churches. The word he used was hate. The church at Antioch wasn't a conventionist church. None were in biblical times. Association churches work with each other, help each other, and do it all without interfering with each other. Are there examples of this in Scripture? 2 Corinthians 11.8 I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. This was referencing to the fact that when Paul was in Corinth, one of the richest churches, the church in Macedonia at Philippi, one of the poorest churches, was sending money to Paul to help him out. 2 Corinthians 8, beginning at verse 19, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. Providing for honest sayings not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, shew ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting. On your behalf. Question 15. Was there such a thing as women especially appointed as helpers in the church? A lot of people fall back to the scripture, not always understanding the contents. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, the misunderstanding of the scriptures caused more than some conflict. So let's take a moment and see what scripture is saying and what it isn't. My first three Sunday school teachers were all women. Sisters Egan, Maddox, and Hurley taught me in primary, junior, and young people classes. Was it scriptural? Of course it was. Two basic matters are being spoken of in the scripture. The first was usurping authority over man. Now, if this offends you, your argument is not with me, it's with God. Second, isn't covered anymore, concerned speaking in tongues, which was done away with by the second century with the completion of the scriptures. This interpretation is confirmed in 1 Timothy 2 and 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, how do we know her silence stops there? Well, 1 Corinthians 11, 5 tells us, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, that is even all one as if she were shaven. Not minding the uncovering of her head, we see women can pray and prophesy. And remember, in those days, men were expected to have their head covered as well, the purpose of the yarmulke. The title of Christ, or Messiah, means anointed one. Scripture records one anointing of Jesus. And do we remember which apostle anointed him? And what qualified the only man to be able to do this? Actually, it's a great question. The only recorded anointing of our Messiah was by a woman. Look in Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 37, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and had wiped them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Jumping ahead to verse 44, 
And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. So why the limitation of usurping authority over men? What caused this limitation and why is it continuing to this day? Following is John's theology. It means this is my belief. I can't prove it. I can't disprove it. But it makes sense to me. Let's think back to the Garden of Eden. He was tempted of the devil or the serpent and ate the forbidden fruit. Now Adam ate it without being tempted and the guilt of the human race is his. It's not hers. So what did she do? Eve knew she had sinned. She told the serpent this at the beginning of the conversation when she made the comment that we're not even going to touch it. And some will say that that was the first sin she lied, but no, that's not the first sin she didn't lie. Remember in James, it says that if you hate your brother, it's the same as murdering him. It's a continuation of the thought, and that's all she did there. She didn't lie. Yet she still chose to offer the fruit to Adam. Why? Why would she do that? The serpent never suggested it. It was of her own decision that if she had failed God, why shouldn't Adam fail him as well? This foolish choice she made resulted in her authority being more restricted than his. Does the Bible record women as helpers in the church? Romans chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. I recommend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sympria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and that ye a sister in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. Question 16. What about public offenses against good morals? Now, 50 years ago, the nunwed mother was a scandal. It brought shame on the entire family, or even families that were involved. Much shame and reproach would lead to what was called doing the right thing, even though the right thing would have been to avoid that situation in its entirety. These days, so many children are born out of wedlock, and so many couples are committing fornication, adultery, or quote-unquote living in sin, that some congregations see this as something normal, that there are worse problems out there to worry about. And there are other problems, indeed, excessive drinking, recreational drug use, pornographic behavior, spousal abuse, and family negligence are some examples. Any church is wrong to ignore any of these things, not just because these are stepping stones to worse behavior, but because overlooking these is the same as condoning these actions. God takes sin seriously. We should as well. The offender should expect to be called out and confronted concerning these manners. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. Then in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, again, this is before Pentecost, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now each situation is different, and if this is a well-known occurrence, they should start with the elders of the church talking to the offender, and go on from there. What about public offenses against good morals? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 3. For I verily was absent in body, but present in spirit, and have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. What we're speaking of here, if you go back to verse 1, is in the church of Corinth, there is a man who was sleeping with his stepmother, his dad's wife. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out in the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Question 17. What if the public offender repents? Some people seek forgiveness when they do wrong. Some are simply sorry they're caught. Let's look at what it means to repent as opposed to being apologetic. When you're unaware you've done something wrong, you can't be repentant because you see nothing to repent of. This is why Jesus prayed for those who are crucifying him, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you know you've done something wrong, you have the opportunity to repent. This is the willful choosing to not do this again, to forsake this in the future. When you know you've done something wrong, you can choose to continue doing it. You can remain backslidden and keep to your sinful ways. However, when the offender chooses to do the latter, the church's hands are tied. But if they repent, if they cease the behavior and ask forgiveness, we are in the forgiving business. Depending upon the situation, the church might seek a probationary period to make sure their repentance is genuine, and they do have that authority. They do have that right. What if the public offender repents? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Last question. What should be done with a brother who walks contrary to gospel order? Now, we're known by the company we keep. This company can have effects on us that we're unaware of because the changes can come slowly. This is why brainwashing works. As we continually bombarded with propaganda, its repetition slowly whittles away at the truth. The scriptures remind us, as we just read, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is a representative of sin, one reason it wasn't permitted in the house during Passover, and why the Lord's Supper does not have wine in it. We'll study that in the next lesson. When someone is blatantly living outside the laws and commandments of our God and Savior, we are commanded to sever ties with them, and those ties include church membership. What should be done with a brother who walks contrary to gospel order? 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition on which he received of us. In conclusion, it is these policies that have allowed the New Testament churches to survive 21 centuries of persecution, prosecution, and executions. When members go astray and either doctrine or morals, the local church must not sit idly by and let nature run its course. Corruption breeds more corruption. Like a cancer, it must be quarantined and then removed. As the lepers of biblical times, they must be separated to prevent others from infection. Good thing. This does nothing to their souls. The Catholics don't understand that. The church roster and the Lance Book of Life are two completely different books. Many names will be in one, but not the other.